I learned ultimately that economics is really easy. The problem is I had to go to graduate school to learn that. And what we want to do is figure out a way of bringing these insights so that people can actually use them not just to think about optimal monetary policy again, but to think about making better decisions in their lives. And the, the sets of decisions I've raised here are precisely the decisions that our students are going to make that I think that they could, uh, they could benefit from you know, having a clearer framework for, for working in. Useful economics focuses on the roles that our students will actually play. It focuses on making better decisions. And the third thing it does is it focuses on broadly applicable principles. And so this is where, you know, you know this old definition of economics, people talk about, you know, business or the stock market or money and all this sort of nonsense. And I think the thing we've learned is economics is in fact a method, that was what Becker claimed in his Nobel address, or it's a set of principles or it's an approach, um, and it's broadly applicable. It's applicable, and again, I've already partly made this case, to every single aspect of our lives. And I think that can also help it resonate with our students, but it also helps them make economics incredibly useful. Right? Remember, few of our students are going to be central bankers, but many of them are going to be consumers, spenders, uh, importers, exporters, and the like. And so here is my favorite distillation of this idea that economics is just a few, few principles, and it comes from Gary Becker. Gary says, economics is an easy subject and a difficult subject at the same time. It's easy in the sense that there are only a few broad principles that really guide most economics. What a great promise. You'll learn a few broad principles and then you're going to be able to figure out uh, useful decisions in just about every domain of your life. And he goes on because he's Gary. So, you know, I hang out with Nobel laureates all the time. You know, you'll get to say that this afternoon when Paul turns up. Um, and, you know, they're all sort of dopey compared to me. Um, uh, but his point is that they're dopey because they think that they can just stroke their chin, think hard, and they'll figure out the answer. And what they really need is a structured form of analysis. They need a few core principles, the deep insights of economics. And from that, they should be able to divine useful decisions going forward. And so you think about what it means to think like an economist. And it really does mean just a few simple principles. It means thinking about opportunity cost. It means consistently um, thinking at the margin. It means thinking in terms of costs and benefits and having an appropriately broad sense of what costs and benefits is. Costs and benefits aren't just money. They're also the, the true pleasure we get from teaching a great class or spending time with our kids. And it means understanding interdependencies between different things. If I buy this sandwich this morning, I can't afford to buy a cup of coffee this afternoon. Um, if I get educated right now, I may or may not be able to go, I, I may or may not have the energy to go out and try and find a spouse. There's trade-offs everywhere, there's interlinkages between markets and those interdependencies, I think are a hallmark of economic analysis. So let's begin on the supply side. The economics profession has changed. How has it changed and how is it that we're different from previous generations of economists? And, and I think the important part, I think we're all aware we're different. What we're not yet doing is bringing that into the classroom. And so I think when many of us teach, we feel a sense of inauthenticity sometimes when what we're doing is we're teaching what's in the book, a style of economics that our predecessors found easier to teach, rather than actually the way we do economics during the day when we talk with our colleagues. And so I think we want to try and um, bring in the new ways in which, which uh, our generation of economists is different. So the first of these is the empirical revolution. And I think there's... Um, you know, two main drivers of the empirical revolution. The first is simply Moore's law, which is just this tendency for the power of computers to double every eight months. And so this is a simple chart showing you through time um, the number of transistors on a typical microprocessor. And you'll notice that the white vertical axis is on an incredible log scale. And so we've gone from 2,300 transistors on a typical microprocessor, or maybe 10,000 around about the time that Ben Bernanke wrote his thesis, to there now being, what is that, 2.6 billion. Okay? And understand, I mean, and I, I, I mean this absolutely. When Ben was writing his thesis, we were down here. And so we are actually in a completely different world than that in which he was educated. Um, we're, we're now in one where the most powerful supercomputer on campus at a time, when Ben Bernanke wrote his thesis, was enormously less powerful than this. Um, and so we have enormous computing power. The second thing we have now, of course, is an enormous quantity of data. This is a, it's one of those sort of graphs that the economist prints where you sort of think they made up the data. Um, but it says, you know, we've gen the claim is we've generated as much data in the past two years as in the entire history of the world. Um, and they say it rises by 60% per year. Look, I'm not going to put any stock in the specific numbers, but the point I think is completely obvious, right? So this morning I woke up, I clicked on my cell phone, I clicked Uber, and a car came, right? Uber now has a database that knows exactly where I, where I live. It also knows that I happen to go to the airport today. I got out at the airport and I, I, uh, I got the ticket out of the machine. And as a result, American Airlines knows that uh, 
40-year-old Australians like, tra like traveling to Miami. This is not my first time here. Um, you know, I got out at the other end and of course I went through so many TSA security cameras and the like and I'm sure I got facially recognized seven different ways and there's probably a TSA agent saying he needs a haircut. Um, <laughs> the point is though that all of these data are being, are being collected somewhere um, and they are now the grist for economics. Um, I had a friend, Phil Leslie, the other day wrote a paper where Phil got, you know, all Starbucks sales in, in, in a couple of states. Every single cup of coffee that had been sold when, you know, when you use those Starbucks loyalty cards used one of them, you're in Phil's data set, okay? So the problem that you and I face as economists, and more importantly, the problem that our, our students face is fundamentally different than previous generations. Our problem's an overabundance of data. There's a tidal wave, there's a torrent. We don't have the time or the energy to figure out just what is in all these databases, what they mean and what they can tell us about economics. That's fundamentally different, right? Paul Samuelson and Milton Friedman used to talk about, you know, they would get a regression to run where they would get 17 years of consumption data and then get an army of graduate students in the basement to invert matrices by hand. Um, so the quantity of data, right now, I, I think, you know, probably on the, the plane ride home, I could probably replicate Greg Mankiw's entire PhD thesis. The quantity of data, our ability to process it are just fundamentally different. So we're moving from a world of data scarcity to data abundance and in fact data overabundance. Here's another way of trying to make the same point and this is a recent paper by Dan Hammermesh in which what Dan did is he went through and coded every year the, the top five economics journals, what was involved in each paper. And the, the, the striking thing is this rise in the use of empirical analysis of non-standard data sets which is what our students are going to be doing in the world. Our students are going to be working for American Airlines and Starbucks and Uber and the like. And you can see this is a dramatic rise that we as a profession are becoming incredibly more empirical and that we're starting to use these offbeat, weird, different data sets that just happen to be sitting on various corporations' hard drives. And so I think the implications of this really can't be overstated. Um, you know, before the problem was that data are scarce. Today the problem is that data are overabundant. And so previously, when you had scarce data, it fundamentally changed the relationship of economic theory to what we're trying to do. Economic theory was there to fill in for the fact that we didn't have data. When we didn't know stuff, we'd write down a model and try and figure out what the heck was probably happening in the background anyway. And so it used to be that, you know, if there was some question you wanted the answer to, you'd write down a little theoretical model and you'd try and figure out what people should have done if they're rational and the following 12 other assumptions are met. Instead, now we live in a world where data are overabundant. And so the problem our students face is exactly the different, is exactly the opposite of the one their parents face, which they have so much data and they're not quite sure what to do with it. And this is where I think economics is incredibly useful. Economics, I, I would reconceptualize economic theory then as a, as a framework for distilling and trying to make sense of these data. Um, so it's a framework for organizing and trying to interpret those facts. Because I think they don't, they're not self-organizing. If you've ever had one of these data sets where someone says, here, have a terabyte, um, and you sit down and you're like, that's awesome, I got the data. And they're like, what next? Um, you know there's insight there. It doesn't scream it out to you, but you've got to figure out how to go mining. And in some sense, we want, to, we want to teach our students a simple framework. I think the third useful implication is the, the new world we live in fundamentally changes the importance of making assumptions. It used to be because we were trying to fill in where we didn't have data, we had to make assumptions about human behavior. We'd have to assume a lot about, you know, rationality, selfishness, um, all these sorts of things. And for many of us, that might be a useful organizing framework, but I know I've met many students who, turn, who have turned up, you know, on, on the second or third day, the professor has said something like, I assume people maximize utility. And they're like, no, they don't. Um, and you and I can have a sophisticated philosophical discussion with them, but the problem is they've checked out right there and then. The whole semester's over. Uh, the, the, this assumption that's so central to much of economic theory simply doesn't resonate with them. Well, instead, we don't have to do that anymore. We actually measure how people act. We don't have to make assumptions about it. We have huge databases telling us how people act. And so, whether you want to call this behavioral economics or perfectly rational economics or simply empirical economics, um, we just don't need to make the strong assumptions, and I think those strong assumptions turn many people off from the economic method. So that's the first change I think we see on the supply side, which is the empirical revolution. The second is this broader ambit for economics. You remember the days when people would go and study economics in college because they wanted to learn, because they wanted to go into the family business or they wanted to learn about the stock market. I think that uh, as a result, we would limit our market if that's all we wanted to appeal to. 
I think we all have a strong sense that economics has become enormously more interesting. I've worked on the economics of happiness, I've worked on marriage and divorce, I've worked on racial discrimination, um, and all of this is work that's fundamentally been enabled by, the, by, by folks like Gary Becker or, or Steve Levitt or, um, or others who've sort of said economics is powerful and can be taken to any question just about every, anywhere. And that's, that's great for our, the business we're in. It's great for our business because we're in the, we, we, it makes us interesting. Crikey, imagine that, an interesting economist, uh, where we can speak about interesting issues du jour. Now, I wasn't quite sure how empirically to make this point, so I did it a very simple way, which is in, um, I went to the Marginal Revolution blog this morning, and I just got the last 10 headlines. And they're pretty interesting. And I think of this as being roughly, um, as, you know, I think of Marginal Revolution as being roughly representative of, of the state of the economics profession. Alex may be surprised to hear me say that, but um, it, certainly is, it certainly is fodder for the lunch table whenever I'm talking to fellow economists. And, and the thing about this is you'll notice that what dominates Alex and Tyler's conversations isn't just, you know, GDP growth is up, the unemployment rate's 7.2%, non-fund payrolls grow, are growing at a rate of 150,000. It's not just that stuff. So here we've got, the most recent thing was something about competency-based learning. Um, so uh, alternatively, you can think about that as human capital accumulation. Um, there is a more classic one. Tyler got very excited about unemployment and business cycles. He read a paper and he wanted to tell us all about it. Um, then the next one was uh, a betting market and how long the government shutdown will last. Well, that's really interesting, right? So the government shut down, a lot of politics there. How, how long will it last? Why don't we ask a betting market? It seems interesting. Um, why did Obama try to scare the markets? And he did yesterday. He's like, why hasn't Wall Street sold off and the markets crashed because that would get the Republicans to do something? Um, and trying to think through that, it's a very interesting thought experiment at the intersection of politics and economics. Another way of trying to make the case that economics has become broader, oh no, I think this is from a Levitt article, in which they list the theorists most often cited in motivating empirical research today. But it's an interesting list because, of course, number one is Gary Becker. And Gary, I really think, is the great hero of suggesting that economics applies to everything. But you go down that list and you see people like Roland Benabou, who's done a lot of work on culture, um, the great Danny Kahneman, I saw, I was pleased that our swag was Danny's book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. Um, Danny is one of the most fascinating social scientists uh, in the last 50 years. Um, the great George Akerlov's on this list. Um, George, whose recent work has been on culture. But again, the point is that the people who are inspiring us as economists are enormously more interesting than, than the folks, and broader than the folks inspiring a previous generation. If you wanted to think about the previous generations of great economists, you would have to think of you know, Keynes and um, you know, Marshall and um, Marx and um, you know, all these guys. But they're all sort of thinking about the same thing, which is you know, what causes the wheels on the business cycle line, right? This next generation, I think, are enormously more interesting than just figuring out wiggles. The third thing I think that the economics profession can now do is more realistic economics. I remember talking to my sister-in-law, she's a very, very smart woman, she'd done her first economics class, and she walked in and the professor had said, needs are limited, wants are unlimited. Which to us as economists seems like boring, inane, obviously true. She's like, that's absurd. She thinks it's absurd that wants could be unlimited. She just wants a few things, as soon as she gets them, I guess she's done. I don't know, she hasn't gotten those few things yet because she's still working for a living. Um, but the point was that the professor started with an assumption he didn't need to start with. And as a result, he literally lost her on day one and she never took another economics class again. Um, and I think we now get to be enormously more realistic. We get to talk about how people act rather than you know, making strong assumptions. So I think what the supply side tells us is we're different. The supply curve of useful economics has shifted. We're more useful than the previous generation. The curve has shifted to the right. When the supply curve shifts to the right, what should happen? The quantity should increase. We should be teaching more useful economics. And I think this is going to turn out to be welfare enhancing because I think the demand curve says students are fundamentally interested in useful economics. And so here it's worth taking a look at what is it our students are doing and does that give us some sense of what useful economics is?